Okay, since you guys have an exam this week, we're going to take a look at this practice exam. So most of the problems we're going to tonight are going to be loops. Um, before we do the loops, I'm going to do another example of piecewise stuff. So we'll get started with that. Uh, if you have problems with number one, that's like a F open, F close kind of thing. Uh, there's another video on that, so you can check that out if you need to. But let's, let's look at this. Okay, so problem two um, asks you to graph this piecewise function, and it gives you several different um, ways to do it. So we're going to work through each one of those ways. The first way is using um, something called a unit step function. So, unit step function um, essentially looks like this. So what it's really doing is, and we'll create some sort of, I guess, dummy variables is it pretty much is acting as a switch. So if you look at this on the graph, you'll see that, okay, it's going to be zero all the way up until, well, the value is zero, and then it's going to spike up to one, and it's going to stay at one. So really, it turns on um, after x is greater than zero, and it stays there. So the point of this is once you have this, you can make something called an indicator function. Um, and the point of the indicator function, you'll see it's pretty useful in a little bit, is it takes three arguments and it uses that unit step function um, to get its job done. So if we define A as, say, negative three and B as three, and we graph this function, is that behaves very similar to the unit step function except it only turns on in the area between A and B. So what that helps you do, especially if you're looking at the piecewise functions over here, is it turns the function on during regions that you care about. So now we're going to use this um, to plot our piecewise function over, well, negative 4 to 4. So I'm going to set all the x values. Um, between that. Sorry, I did not mean to plot that again. So, I'm just going to comment these out quickly. Okay. So, how are we going to find f? Well, we need to define several smaller functions um, that are basically uh, the left hand side of piecewise. So, I'm going to do that because it makes the problem slightly simpler. So, with that syntax for a second. So I'm breaking the piecewise function into three different parts. Okay, so now we can make the entire thing by taking the values. Um, well, let me show you what we're going to do first. We're going to essentially take the dot product between the individual uh, piecewise functions and the ranges that they're valid in. Okay, so if you look over here, this is valid between negative 1 and 1. This is valid between, um, this gets kind of confusing, probably between negative 3 to negative 1, and then 1 to 3, and then we have this otherwise over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start uh, from the outside and work in. So we're going to start if our endpoint. So we're going to do the indicator function at negative 4, and then I see that the function is going to change at negative 3. And then I'm going to add the next part of the function, uh, which is going to be f2, because remember f2 is going to be between negative 3 and negative 1, and then between 1 and 3. So I'm going to dot it with the indicator function uh, between that range. And you're pretty much going to keep doing this um, until you've completed the entire function. Um, the reason for this dot here is that we are doing this with vectors. Um, we got to be careful about that. Not too careful though. So 
problem, but just if you're having problems, I guess, understanding what's going on here, just remember that these indicator functions are acting as switches. Uh, 1, 3, and then finally the last part, 3 of x is between 3 and 4. I'm sure we're going to get some small error message in here, or we'll get a look at what happens. Okay, so then we pretty much get the graph. Now you can do a lot of nice uh, cosmetic things with grid and F, I guess x-axis and y-axis and all that jazz, but um, Sophocles doesn't really grade on that, so I'm not going to bother doing it, but feel free to get very nice with it. Okay, so now let's do the problem again, but we're going to do it with um, piecewise conditionals. So I'm going to take these um, parts again, and pretty much it's the same idea. So we're going to take, instead of the indicator functions, keep missing that, we're just going to take the ranges of values um, and write them as conditions. So we could actually just use these statements because those conditionals are already valid for us. You'll see in a sec. So before we had the indicator function here, but now we can just use the exact condition uh, that they give us. And remember, you still need to add these up because it's a sequence of switches. Sometimes, um, well, the goal is to only turn on one of the piecewise functions at a time. The other ones are going to be zero um, when they're not being turned on. Um, and this you could write as a compound um, conditional using the and. Last part at 3 of x um, will be for the absolute one is huh. should be for okay, so we can read it straight off the graph over here. It's gonna be if x is less than negative three or x is greater than 3. Might get an error there. We'll see. Oh, no, that no, looks like we're good again. And I'm going to take this in one space from before. And just make use of that. Yeah. x. F x. And there we go. Same graph. Cool. Okay, so the last method. Again, doesn't change too much um, from the previous ones. It's simply making a function and using the function instead. So I'm going to start by making the vector that we're going to use, well, copying the vector that we're going to use, um, and just taking this. So we're going to make a function called test. Okay, so let's see. I already have sort of test over here. Okay, so we have to remember how to make separate M files in MATLAB. So syntax is always going to look like this. Um, you have a function output, and then the name of your function. It's got to be test2. Be careful of that. Um, and that ends like that. So here you're going to do the same thing that you were doing in the previous parts uh, with this stuff. So let's do that. If abs of x. Um, then, well, I guess output is going to be 1. If 1 is less than times of x, and times of x is less than 3, um, output will be this function. I already have a test prepared. I don't see it that different. 
Okay. So there's really no difference in these. I could look around for what makes them different for a little while, but at the end of the day it shouldn't change anything. Um of course that isn't what we wanted either. Could be the why. be a lot of things. Um, okay, I'll post something up later tonight. Um, the idea is essentially the same. There's no reason I'm going over it that much longer. If you're that concerned, you can message me. Um, other than you know, spending 10 minutes trying to figure that out, I'd rather go on with forwards. So let's look at problem 3. That's, the, whoops. That's pretty much what I wanted to do most of tonight. It is um, look at those for loops. Okay, so in this problem, pretty much it wants us to compute some sort of sum in very many annoying ways. So it gets us started by saying that n big n is 15, and first it wants us to sum up the first 15 terms of this um, sequence. So that isn't too bad. And we have a for loop. So we're going to go from some iterator variable, k, we're going to go from 1 to 15 on that, well, we're actually going to go to 0, so look over here, this dump starts at 0, so we're going to start at 0. So from 0 to n, um, we're simply going to take, well, what's the easiest way to explain this, alright, um, we're going to take, this formula that they have over here, and we're going to add those up. Okay, this is where things get a little complicated. So it's a sequence that adds up all the terms. So what we have written right now simply replaces k uh, for each value that, well, replaces s for each value that k takes. So we're going to compute. Um, the sum when k is 0, k is 1, k is 2, all the way through that. So this is a common mistake that many students make in thinking that this, this will work. So this add, doesn't actually add up any of the terms. So what we need to do is we need to take um, an old version, or the previous term of the sequence, and add it back into here. Uh, you should get familiar with this idea as I use it more. So. Whenever you make this move, you need to make some sort of initial condition. In this case, we're going to add the first value of k when k is 0 is simply this number of the term, which is 1. So, we've already defined that. Let's start the sequence at 1, because we've already computed the 0 value. Okay, and that should get us what well, we don't want to display as old. We want to display at the end it is s. So that's the value of the sum after 15 terms. Okay, well, let's look at it um, in the case that we're doing a while loop instead, a conventional while loop. So here, uh, we want to loop through the sequence. Um, we still want to do it until we're at big N. So we're going to do it while k is less than or equal to big N. Again, we have to define that. And the loop, and the same kind of business. S is going to be the previous term of the sequence, um, plus whatever the recursive formula is that's been given to us. And we need to replace S old, or we get stuck with the same value every time. Um, and this time, before we had the for loop, increase uh, the value of k, our iterator variable. But now we need to do that ourselves. So that's the point of this line here. So we'll start at k equals 1 with our initial condition. Uh, the s is that. And so this would be checking is 1 less than 15? Yeah. Okay, so then it assigns a new value to s. Um, this gets us 
um, s one k equals one, and then it stores that, and we up k to be two, and we do the same thing all over again. So our s is agree, which means we've correctly um, done, I guess, the recursive formula. So next part of the question asks for the while loop, um, a forever while loop. So that has the form of while some statement is always true, and then it continues from there. Uh, you have to be careful with both kinds of the while loop because you can get stuck in an infinite loop, and then you can't get out, and then MATLAB crashes if you aren't careful. So you can always use Control C to break out of the loop, but sometimes even that doesn't work. So immediately after you've written the forever while loop, you should write your break condition. So our break condition happens to be if k is less than or equal to n, or if k is greater than uh, n, that's when we break out of the loop. And the next thing you need to do is basically take this stuff and insert it into the loop. So the general formula for, well, I'll go over this bit, um, but you need to be careful about the order in which you do things here. Um, here it doesn't matter since we'll be increasing the value of k and that doesn't really affect these too much. Um, but it matters more, especially in other problems. Oh yeah, I forgot the initial conditions. So as old starts at 1, when k is 1, and I also forgot to give the value of n. Okay, and now comes s, which is the same as was before. Okay, now we need to do the vectorized sum function. Okay, so for this, first we should um, define k from 1 to n. Of course, we need to define n first. But then, um, all you need to do is put whatever they defined sequence to be inside a vector and you'll get a vector with you gotta be careful with that of course. You'll get each value and then you can simply sum them up and you'll get that which is okay we forgot to add s old but here well we still can't start as well. Okay yeah so we start at zero and then we'll get the same value uh, as we did before. Okay, and then the analytical formula is just uh, using this here. Is it even worth doing that? I guess just to confirm uh, that everything else we've been doing has been right. So, we'll do that quickly. 2 to the plus 1. And it's the same. Cool. Okay. So the next part of the problem asks us to do some of this with a function that we're going to write. So they want that function to have a switch statement. So we're going to do that over here. Get out of here, test two. Um, so first you need to write a function declaration. Um, and we're going to write it like this function and the inputs. So it gives us the two inputs, big N and M. So the way that you write a switch statement is you say switch and then whatever um, determines, whatever variable determines the switch. And in this case, it's going to be M. So we choose values of M that are going to be 1 through 5. Um, and then those are going to determine which method we use. So it's going to be switch M and then you write cases. So you write case one, case two, case three, case four, case five, and you write otherwise um, not one through five. So this will handle cases where the user does not um, submit the right number um, at all. That's fine. Um, 
Um, so the only thing you need to do here is take whatever you wrote for each of these parts um, and put that into that part of the switch statement. So this code should work just fine. Of course you don't want to put the part redefine big N because big N is being sent to the function. If not, you'll just get vacuously true results. Um, so let's make sure we got that right. Cases, um, you can see that it's simply going to be a copy paste of the other parts of the problem. Okay, so what do we want to do with this? We want to find the smallest value of n such that this condition is true. We want to use conventional while loop. Okay, so conventional while loop, while, and then our breaking condition. Um, I guess in this case it's going to be while. But well, we're going to continue this process while s is less than 7, and then we're going to. Well, it's going to make it even easier. While this is less than that, um, we're simply going to increase the value of n and keep running it until we finally get something that works. Starting at 1, and then we'll see what our results are. So, we'll display it at the end. I forgot. Yeah, so let's start at 1, and we get the value of n to be 19. So now we should test to make sure that um, that value does indeed satisfy what we set out to do, uh, which would be the first number that is greater than 10 to the 7th. And you can see that that's true here. When we're at n minus 1, um, we're still under 10 to the 7th. And then when we're at oh, 19, we finally satisfy that. Okay, so the last part of the problem asks for you to solve um, for big N using F0. So that, they're always going to give you an equation. And you need to make that an equation that equals 0 on the right hand side. So you simply take the left hand side, 1 plus n, and you can make it vectorized as well, uh, plus 1, and subtract whatever's on the right. And now we see that this function equals 0, so we can simply take it, um, and then the second value you need to put in as a guess, we'll put in 10, and there we go. So they also want you to round it to the next integer, so you just take the steel of it which is 19, which is the value we got for big N over here. Okay, let's do some bigger and better things. So, let's take a look at problem 4. Uh, so again, we're given a function. In this case, um, the first thing we want to do, we're given a tolerance, and we want to test when uh, two subsequent terms are between, well, two subsequent terms are smaller than a given number. In this case, we're going to call it number tolerance. Um, the tolerance we're given here is 10 to the negative 10. So we want to test when this condition is true. Okay? So at this point, um, it's good to write down an algorithm for how to solve these problems. So, solving, um, looping problems with tolerance conditions. So you're always going to follow this general algorithm. You're going to decide what kind of loop you want. Then you're going to write the loop. 
loop, you're going to get new value check against the old value set the old value to the new value. And then you're going to write initial conditions. Okay, so that probably seems confusing, but I'm going to go over what that means now. So step one, they're telling us that we're going to do this um, with a conventional while loop. Okay, this stuff over here is just graphing stuff. I'm going to ignore that because it's frankly pretty easy. So we're going to start by doing the conventional. Okay, conventional means while, and then we use whatever convention. Uh, condition they want. The condition they want this time is going to be this. So while this condition is true, the difference um, is less than the tolerance, this stuff happens. So that was deciding what kind of loop we wanted. And it's just a conventional while loop. So now we write the loop. We write the loop by doing this step, this step, and this step. So step one is we get the new value. What's the new value equal to? Well, they give us a formula for the new value. So it's going to be x of k plus 1. These will cos x of k. Okay. Um, then we check this value against the old value. So this is where things get a little confusing. You see that this happens and then we check this. That's the order that things need to stay in. Um, I'm going to write the next two lines and you're going to get confused, but I'm going to do my best to explain it. We're going to set the old value. Well, we're going to check and we're going to set the old value. I guess 
the iterator um, finishes at 58, so the function value will be that. Okay, so they also want us to solve this with f0, so I'm going to do that here. Um, so for f0, again we have a function, um, and it needs to equal 0, so we take the left hand side minus the right hand side, just like that. Then you simply apply f0 to the function, and you guess. So for here, remember that the function was 0 around that value. So we just guess 0, and we get what that is. Um, what else do we want? Well, we could compare them to 11 different places, but I mean, there's no real reason to do that. Okay, so d wants the intersection um, of two functions. So, yeah, sure we can do that. Um, and it wants it between 0 and 2. So let's define y to be keep them at x, yeah. Then we'll call the second one g. gets us that. That's essentially what we want. Okay. Now the rest of the problem, graph an error function, you're just going to define the function to be that, then you use semi-log y, so that's nothing uh, too interesting. So let's look at the last for loop problem, uh, problem 5. So problem 5. So here, um, you should be seeing that a lot of these are pretty similar. We get a lot of flavor text, wants us to graph it, I don't really want to do that again. And then it asks us to solve um, for some sort of k where basically two subsequent terms are going to be less than the tolerance. So essentially the same problem as before, but sort of backwards. Um, we want to use f0 on this, so again same as usual, we need to write a function that's equal to zero. So here we have this over here, k plus one over uh, two to the k. Um, I'm actually going to find a second function.
Okay. So, back to the problem. So we have some sort of... Okay, we basically need to write um, the forever while loop for finding when two subsequent terms are going to be less than the tolerance. So the way we do that, um, we're going to use our algorithm yet again. So we've decided what kind of conditional we're going to use. Um, in this case, it's going to be the forever while loop. And now we need to write the loop. So first thing we need to find is the new value. How do we find the new value? Um, we're given a recursive function for the new value. So in this case, it's going to be exactly uh, this as follows. Notice that this part right here is simply f of k, uh, which we previously defined. So I'm going to pull that down here. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we need to check against the old value. So here we write our conditional. Um, if the absolute value of s of k minus s of k minus 1 uh, is less than the tolerance, then we break out of the loop, and we're done. The next thing we need to do is we need to set the old value to the new value. So in this case, the old is k minus 1, and we need to set that to whatever we came up with here. Then we need to increase the iterator variable, um, and then we're done. Well, technically we're not done. We still need to write initial conditions. So we need to find out where k starts. Notice that k starts at 0. Um, the problem with this is that we've defined s to be a vector, and in MATLAB, you can't have an s of 0. So they even tell you down here, they give you the tip for how to do this. So you actually need to start k equals 1, um, and set the first value of s to be 1, and then you need to set second value uh, to be, well, it's going to be exactly how you define this down here, which is simply going to be S1 plus F of 2. Should be that. Okay, and the reason you need to do this is, again, if you don't have these initial conditions, your entire loop is going to fail almost immediately. Because it'll get to something um, that isn't defined yet, and it'll crap out on you. So that's why you need to do that. Um, yeah, see, even I accidentally gave you the wrong value. And so you need to start at k at 2. In other words, if we start at 1, we try to access s of 0, which is not defined in math. So, that's the value that it breaks at, and that's what it equals um, when it does that. So the next question is, well, I guess that's kind of pointless to show, let's show the difference. Okay, and that's clearly less than the tolerance. So the next problem, the next part of the problem says, alright, Do it with conventional while loop. So this is almost identical to the previous problem. So again, conventional while loop, we start with our condition. Our condition is this. But we want to keep doing it until our sequence is finally under that value. Is there an end down here? Okay, I guess my lab just put that up. Um, so if we're on our algorithm, First thing we write is this chunk here. We get the new value, then we remember that. Okay, when we're doing this part, we're getting a new value. The loop's coming back up to here, um, and it's checking it against the old. So the next part of the problem, um, then we set the old value, and then we increase the counter variable by one. Now I'm pretty confident this is going to work. So I'm just going to get rid of this, and the initial conditions are exactly the same. So run it, it's still 39, and this should still work. Okay, so that's still less than the tolerance. Uh, great.
graphing it isn't too difficult, so I'm not going to do that. Um, six, there should be another video um, that already goes over that. Same with seven, that's using the find function. There should be something already about that. Um, sorry about not getting the test.m to work, but kind of threw that together quickly. Um, I think that's about it for 